Welcome to this webinar on using hoop houses for extending your growing season. My name is Jeff Berkby. I'm Outreach Director for the National Center for Probate Technology, also called NCAT. NCAT is a national nonprofit organization in the U.S. which works in the areas of sustainable agriculture, sustainable energy, and sustainable communities. One of the main projects we manage at NCAT is the National Sustainable Agriculture Information Service, which is also called ATRA. ATTRA. ATRA is funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Rural Business Cooperative Services, and funding for this webinar is, is part of the USDA funds provided to ATRA. We at NCAT are very grateful to USDA for their support of ATRA and for this webinar support. Our ATRA website is available at www.atra.ncat.org, and this information will appear later on in the webinar on your screen. We have more than 300 free publications available on our website um, for download, covering a wide variety of sustainable agriculture topics, including horticultural crops, field crops, farm energy issues, organic certification, integrated pest management, and livestock issues. We invite you to visit our ATRA website after the webinar for more information on these and other sustainable agriculture topics. Today's webinar on using hoop houses for extending your growing season will run for about an hour. About 45 minutes of that presentation will be online with the interaction with our speakers and the presentation you'll see on your screen. During the presentation, you'll see a question comment box on the right-hand side of your computer screen. If you think of any questions you'd like to have our speakers address after the 45-minute presentation, feel free to type them into the comment box during the presentation. We'll then have about 10 or 15 minutes at the end of the presentation to pick out a few questions to discuss. Um, we're truly in a national uh, webinar today across country. Um, our two speakers um, are both NCAT employees, Tammy Hinman and Andy Pressman, and they're both horticultural specialists with, N with NCAT. Tammy Hinman is based in our NCAT Montana office and comes to us today from Montana. Tammy holds a bachelor's degree from Colorado State University in horticultural food crops and entomology and a master's degree in food system studies from Antioch University. Andy Pressman, our second speaker, is also an NCAT employee and is coming to us today from our NCAT office in Pennsylvania. Andy has a master's degree in sustainable systems from Slippery Rock University and is a certified permaculture designer. Both Andy and Tammy have done extensive presentations on hoop houses and hoop house construction. With that brief introduction, I'll turn it over to Tammy Hinman to start our webinar on extending your growing season with the use of food houses. Tammy? Thanks, Jeff, and um, welcome, everyone. Thanks for attending. Before we begin, I just wanted to mention that this webinar is mainly an introduction to hoop house setup and production. It will be most useful for people that are considering putting one up on their farm or property but have not yet done so. On your screen is a list of the multiple benefits of growing with hoop houses. While the benefits are numerous, there are also some costs, time, and skills required to install one on your property. Andy and I will be discussing these factors today. Most growers install hoop houses to extend the growing season earlier in the spring and later in the fall, but some growers produce crops through the winter in their hoop houses. This is, this is particularly true in the south, but also as far north as Vermont. Andy will be talking about this shortly. The hoop house is not only protect against frost, but also from excess precipitation, wind, and other inclement weather that can stress plants. Also, when there is rain or snow outside, the hoop house provides a place for your field crew to continue working and harvesting. Finally, the protective environment inside a hoop house typically produces a higher yield. Here is an example of the season extension benefits of a hoop house. On your screen is a, a hoop house built by Martin and Krista Stosiak of Mark Christo Farm in Hillsdale, New York. In the spring, the Stosiaks use this hoop house to grow out transplants for plant sales and farmers markets and these flowering baskets that you see up here on the purlins. Then this hoop house is planted into cut flowers once these are cleared out in the spring. With that, I'm going to hand this over to Andy to talk about the different uses, types, and construction possibilities for setting up a hoop house on your farm. Thanks, Tammy. 
Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. It's great to see that there's so much interest in hoop houses throughout the country. As Tammy mentioned, the goal of using a hoop house is for season extension, and really what we're interested in is increasing our cash flow by getting into markets sooner and staying later. It's during these times that crops tend to get better market prices. I'm going to spend my time with you all discussing the overall structure and use of a hoop house in relation to a hoop house being an appropriate technology, especially for small-scale growers. The few degrees of frost protection that is achieved with the hoop house, on average gaining 4 to 12 degrees, is why it is possible to get crops started early in the spring and continue through the late fall or even winter. Hoop houses have been used throughout many parts of the world for several decades, including Europe, Asia, and the Middle East, and at various scales, including multiple acres under plastic. Hoop houses have only been utilized in North America for the past 15 to 20 years. The term hoop house most often refers to a hoop-shaped structure that is covered with a polyethylene film. This polyfilm acts as a cloud by trapping long-wave radiant heat that protects the soil from freezing. Hoop houses are generally not heated, although some growers use supplemental heat or ventilation fans to keep the inside temperature above freezing. The main focus of this presentation is on high tunnels. However, I'm going to start by discussing low tunnels, which are an inexpensive alternative to high tunnels. They consist of wire hoops that are covered with a plastic film or a fabric cover, such as a floating rope cover, often referred to as reme. In addition to being inexpensive, they are easy to install, they are easily cooled to prevent plants from bolting, and it's easy to switch from a polyfilm to a fabric cover. They are also easy to remove so that the salt doesn't build up in the soil, which may damage crops. On the downside, low tunnels are labor intensive because the cover has to be removed for ventilation, watering, weeding, and harvesting which is also limited during unfavorable weather conditions. And weeds are very happy in the microclimate that you are creating inside the low tunnel. Here in the northeast where I'm located, chickweed, for example, likes to establish itself in a low tunnel. High tunnels refer to being high enough to stand up in and possibly drive a vehicle or tractor through. There are many different shapes, sizes, and styles of high tunnels and all can be semi-permanent, temporary, or movable structures. They are typically classified as temporary structures for property assessments and taxation purposes, and they often don't require a building permit. A single bay or solo high tunnel is one unit, whereas multi-bay consists of a series of interconnected tunnels. Multi-bay tunnels are frequently associated with hay grove tunnels. These tunnels are three season structures and are 8 to 10 feet high that vent more fully to eliminate excess heat and moisture. The shape of a high tunnel affects its performance. It's important to consider the shape for permitting light but also for shedding snow and rain. There are two general shapes, Quonset and Gothic. A Quonset is a relatively short structure that has a rounded roof and sloped sides. A Gothic arch has a high pointed peak and straight sidewalls. These tend to shed more snow due to having a steeper slope and taller sides provide more usable space. The air exchange and moisture control tends to be better because of the higher gable and the angle sheds water that condenses on the interior of the polyfilm. A single bay can be either Quonset or Gothic but the multi-bays are usually gothic shaped. Size is important to consider first and foremost in regards to how much growing space you need now and also in the future. How much time you have is also an important factor to consider because your labor is going to increase, especially in the beginning as you discover the learning curve associated with your particular hoop house. Keep in mind that you can always add on in the future. Your site may also play a critical role in determining the size of your high tunnel. On average, the length of a tunnel is 14 to 40 feet long. A width to length ratio of 1 to 2 will achieve the highest passive solar gain. However, 
it tends to be more economical to increase the length. In other words, you get more bang for your buck with a longer tunnel. Narrow tunnels tend to lose more heat because of the ratio between the perimeter and the growing area. For example, a 10 foot by 90 foot high tunnel has 200 linear foot perimeter and a 900 square foot growing space, whereas a 30 foot by 70 foot high tunnel also has 200 linear foot perimeters but has 2100 square feet of growing space. This is a significant increase in growing area with less than half the ratio of the perimeter or possible heat loss to the growing area. Also, taller tunnels tend to have better ventilation and air circulation. High tunnels can be constructed so that they are movable. Alex and Betsy Hitt of Peregrine Farms in North Carolina move their high tunnels throughout the season as part of their crop rotation. And we'll see photos here in a few slides of their operation. As mentioned earlier, hoop houses can be in production three or four seasons out of the year. According to Steve Moore at the Center for Environmental Farming Systems, for every two days earlier you get a crop in the ground, you get the equivalent to a one day earlier harvest. This equals about a two month head start in the spring from the last frost date. Looking into the spring, tomatoes, peppers, cucurbits can all be started for transplanting or in permanent beds where in some cases the plastic is later removed during the season. Many crops, such as peas, beans, brassicas, and greens, can be direct seeded. For summer crops, such as tomatoes and squashes, high tunnels can produce higher yields while also helping to control pests and diseases. You can also take into account that there can be a spread of labor load, particularly on days when the weather isn't cooperating outside. One concern to point out, is that pollinators and beneficials are not attracted to going inside a high tunnel. As a result, many farmers introduce beneficial insects inside the high tunnel. Steve Groff in Pennsylvania keeps beehives inside his high tunnels for pollination. I've introduced ladybugs and tryptogamma wasps inside some of my tunnels. And I found that it always helps to have something flowering to help attract the beneficials. Tammy's going to talk a bit more about pest and disease control in a few minutes. Getting back to production, the key to winter success is getting winter crops started in the fall when the days are long enough to promote good plant growth before they get shorter. I know of some growers who utilize high tunnels for winter production to allow them to scale back production or even have time off in the summer. Using a low tunnel in a high tunnel can prevent the soil from freezing during the winter. Studies have shown that this type of system is the equivalent of moving two hardiness zones south. That's an additional four to six degrees and can be a major advantage to northern growers. Some plants may freeze, but tend to be fine and marketable when they thaw out, particularly cold tolerant crops such as spinach. I will discuss this a bit more when I talk about plastics. Looking at the picture on the right, we see a tunnel using shade cloth. This can lower temperatures, especially in the summer, and can result in less watering and less plant stress. This can be advantageous to southern growers in particular. For cut flowers, the shade cloth helps to lengthen stems, and this type of high tunnel is also good for drying herbs and flowers. High tunnels can also be used to raise livestock. In fact, many current designs have come specifically from poultry farmers. Haygrove even has a line of high tunnels, as seen here, for livestock. Now I want to shift gears and talk about the construction of a high tunnel. Success with a high tunnel is highly dependent on its location. You want your structure to be located in a convenient place for perhaps a vehicle or tractor to access, possibly a fuel truck if you're using supplemental heat, but also close to your harvesting and packing area. Water and possibly electricity need to be taken into account. The foundation of a high tunnel needs to be firm, and if you have soils like we have here in Pennsylvania, you will probably have to deal with rocks and other obstacles. The site should be well drained. Therefore, clay soils are less desirable because they don't drain as well. This can cause the soil to remain colder and are more prone to the buildup of salts. Certain levels of salts can damage crops. A well-drained soil may leach salts through the soil profile, but poorly drained soils may actually bring up salts 
as the soil moisture evaporates. Amending the soil can improve the existing soil quality, or swales can be designed to divert excess surface water. The site should offer full sun and wind protection. Shading is important to consider, especially if you are using multiple structures. Some growers suggest placing tunnels as far apart as they are wide to prevent shading from one structure to the next. As we see uh, in the past slide, there was a photo of two, two hoop houses next to each other. Uh, without a shading uh, issue, that grower was able to utilize the space in between for growing greens. Orientation is important as you want to capture the most solar energy and for ventilation. Orientation is specific to your location as the most solar gain in locations that are south of 40 degrees latitude occur when the high tunnel is oriented north-south. Locations that are north of 40 degrees latitude maximize the winter sun by being oriented east-west. Keep in mind that magnetic south and true south are different and you should compensate to get more sun earlier in the day to warm up the tunnel. The ideal location will allow for airflow in the summer and protection from the cold wind in the winter. Consider using wind breaks as long as they don't affect the exposure of the sun, especially for winter growing. If you are using a heater, ventilation is important to provide oxygen to the plants that is otherwise being utilized by the heating system. If you order a high tunnel from a manufacturer, it usually comes in a freight truck, and uh, there's a couple pallets and some boxes, and you also have your long, long pipes and everything. The site doesn't have to be perfectly level, which is an advantage specifically to hay groves, uh, and a slight slope can actually allow for better flow of irrigation water or rainwater collection. Too much slope, uh, particularly around 3%, can affect the structural integrity of the high tunnel. Also, many manufactured high tunnels have pre-drilled holes that won't line up if there's too much difference in the slope. We begin construction by setting the ground posts. Squaring off the structure is critical, and one easy way to do this is by using the Pythagorean theory to help measure off distances, as shown in the photo on the left. Notice the farmer in the right picture is using a jig to easily and accurately space the ground posts at four-foot intervals. Some growers use cement on the corners, but be aware that this may classify the high tunnel as a permanent structure. The frame of a high tunnel can be made from wood, polyvinyl chloride, or PVC, high tensile strength steel, or electric conduit. Wood tends to be expensive. PVC is cheaper, but more prone to collapse under heavy snow or wind conditions. If this is a concern, Schedule 40 PVC is stronger than Schedule 20. With steel, it is important that the galvan it is galvanized to prevent rust. And electric conduit is a good option for narrow quonset shaped and smaller tunnels. The bows are short pieces that connect or fit into the ground posts. Their spacing depends upon the overall design, anticipated snow load, and strength of material. You also have numerous braces, cross ties, trusses, and drops to incorporate. But before we incorporate those, we're going to want to install the purlins. The purlins run horizontal and help to stabilize the structure. They are connected to the bows, and there is a center ridge with purlins on each side. Moving to the baseboard, this sits on the ground and gives the hoop house stability, and it's where the plastic is attached. We also have hip boards that run along the sides of the high tunnel a few feet off of the ground. The polyfilm is attached here by using a batten or a piece of hardware known as a wiggle wire or a polylock, which is a specific brand name. End walls are often sold separately from a manufactured unit. Some growers build their own end walls. If you're planning on using wood, be aware that wood prevents light transmission. I've used polycarbonate or rigid plastic, which is easy to work with, and you can also use a polyfilm as shown in the picture on the far right. 
I want to take a moment to mention some organic regulations for anyone who is interested or may be certified. The organic regulations state that producers must not use lumber that has been treated with arsenates or other prohibited materials where it can contact soil or livestock. The prohibition applies to new and replacement installations. Treated wood on existing structures will not need to be replaced or shielded unless the certifier identifies a clear hazard. Please understand that final judgment rests with the certifier. There are also regulations on using plastics for weed control. Some plastic mulches are allowed to be used for weed control, provided that they are removed from the field at the end of the growing season. Despite their approval in organic crop production under the stated guidelines, the certifying agency would have to determine whether or not this could somehow be applied to your situation. Tammy will be addressing weed control in a few minutes. In terms of plastics, a greenhouse type plastic is much more superior to construction grade plastics or visqueen that can be found at local hardware stores. The greenhouse quality polyfilm is UV resistant, it transmits light better, it's more resistant to wind, heat, yellowing, and has a stronger lifespan. A good high tunnel can last 20 or so years. Polyfilms do lose a percentage of their ability to transmit light over time. Therefore, the poly should be replaced according to the manufacturer's recommendations. Some plastics are treated with an anti-condensate additive to prevent condensation drip, and there are also inf infrared re-radiant, or IR, materials that reduce overnight heat loss. There are several methods to apply the plastic, and each one has a learning curve. But the key with any is to make sure that the plastic is tight enough to not cause any flapping. Some growers use a double layer of poly to help protect from wind and snow damage and to provide slightly warmer temperatures. Using a blower to inflate between the two layers can provide additional insulation and reduce heat loss by up to 40%. However, light levels tend to be less and can cause plants to be weak and leggy. Single layers do just fine, and if, you're, if you need additional protection, you can implement using a low tunnel inside the high tunnel, as shown on the picture on the right. Again, heat and moisture need to be monitored, and venting is usually required during the day. This is because we don't want heat and excess moisture to build up as it can damage the plants and promote disease. Venting can be done through the gable ends, ridge vents, removable end walls, or roll-up or roll-down sides from the hip boards. The roll-up sides are common, but a newer concept of rolling down may in fact produce better yields. They are used in poultry houses, and the idea is to not shock animals or plants that are in the ground with cold air when, the, when opening the sides. If you're using benches in your hoop house, then you're going to want to go with the roll-up sides for the same reason. Researchers at Michigan State University have found that having a straight piece of frame before the curve of the high tunnel provides better side-to-side -side ventilation. This also allows for better use of space along the sides. However, they are finding that yields are better from the center of the high tunnel rather than the sides. This leads me to my final slide on interior layout. A good interior layout optimizes crop production and accessibility. Beds can be oriented in a longitudinal design or in a lateral layout. Things to consider in your layout include shading, irrigation, and traffic, especially if you plan on driving a vehicle or a tractor through the high tunnel. At this time, I'm going to turn things back over to Tammy, who is going to discuss some concepts of growing in a hoop house and the economics and marketing strategies that are involved. All right. Thanks, Andy. Growing in a hoop house provides a protective environment for your crops, but the environment inside will require to you to make some important production considerations, which are listed here on your screen. I will briefly outline some of these considerations here today. Whether in the hoop house or in the field, soil management is a tenant of a healthy farm and should be given special consideration in a hoop house because of the intensive cropping system. When evaluating the health and structure of your soil, as Andy mentioned earlier, clays tend to be the least desirable due to poor drainage and the high potential for salinization. 
so you need to choose your site carefully. Once you have chosen your site and your hoop house is up and running, however, you can maintain good soil fertility through adding organic matter such as compost or green manures. Green manures, like what you see here at My Evergreen Farm, are crops that are grown for the sole purpose of turning into your soil and adding organic matter and nutrients. This picture from My Evergreen Farm's hoop house shows a fall planted cover crop of rye, which put puts on the bulk of its growth in the spring. It will soon be tilled in for production, for vegetable production in the summer. As I mentioned before, it is important to add nutrients because of the typical intensity of the cropping system in your hoop house. Compost provides a stable nutrient source. Growers typically add high amounts of compost before the hoop house is constructed, then lower levels thereafter. An example would be 10 tons per acre initially before the hoop house construction, then about 5 gallons per 40 square feet. This picture of compost being added to a hoop house at my evergreen farm in Wyoming shows, shows the amount of compost that they're applying in their hoop house. They add their compost manually via garden cart. If your end wall has a large opening or is removable, you can use your tractor to spread the compost. It is important to take care not to add too much compost. This can cause salt buildup, excessive phosphorus levels, especially if you're using an animal-based compost material, and root-feeding pests such as some phylons. Cover cropping is also an option, but often not employed because of the premium space in the hoop house. But if you have several hoop houses with some extra space, this can be an option. Fertigation can be used by injecting fertilizer into the irrigation system. The amount you need should be determined by a soil test and nutrient recommendations for the crop you are growing. You can get a soil test at most cooperative your local cooperative extension service. Heavy feeders such as flowers, tomatoes, cucumbers, and broccoli could benefit from fertigation. Some examples of fertilizer used in a fertigation system are compost tea, commercial fertilizer, and fish emulsion. Foliar feeding is also a low-tech option of supplying soluble nutrients. Some examples of this are kelp, fish emulsion, and some micronutrient solutions if your crops are sh showing micronutrient deficiencies such as iron and zinc. Another option for managing soil and pests is crop rotation. If you only have one hoop house, consider building a movable one, which Andy referred to earlier. This can help you integrate the hoop house into your, farm, your entire farm's crop rotation. Andy talked briefly about how your hoop house can be used at different times in the season. I'm going to expand on this, as well as discuss the types of crops and cropping sequences for your hoop house. There are several types of crops that lend well to hoop house growing. I always advise farmers to consider high value crops because of the extra costs associated with building and maintaining your hoop house. Typical crops are lettuce, tomatoes, cucumbers, pep peppers, and specialty flowers. Before planting, evaluate which crops you can get a good price per square foot in your hoop house. On your screen are some high, higher value but not as typical examples for you to consider um, growing in your hoop house. On your top, on the top left are strawberries, which are actually grown quite often in a hoop house because they have a high incidence of disease and insects in the field, and they can also command a higher price in the off season. On the bottom left, you'll see a picture of brambles being grown. In recent years, this has become more and more of a phenomenon because the hoop house can extend the harvest season by four to five weeks and also prevent rain from ruining the berries just before harvest. Cherries are another example of an interesting crop. Often they're grown in, multi, in a multi-tunnel system, such as the one you see here. The fruit has less of a tendency to split, and yields are consistently higher under the hoop houses. Crop succession planning is another consideration. Growers will often plant two to three crop successions in a single season. Some annual examples of this would be lettuce or greens in the early spring, tomatoes or melons or warm season crop in the mid-spring through fall, and then you could plant strawberries in the fall and harvest them later on in the spring. 
timing is critical with ensuring that your crop is ready before field grown produce to give you a competitive market advantage. So this should be taken into account when you're timing your succession planning. For more on succession planning, see the Atropod Scheduling Vegetable Plannings for Continuous Harvest. Finally, there are specific varieties that lend well to growing in the hoop house. Examples of this would be, for winter production, specific varieties that can withstand much colder temperatures. These are often indicated in the catalogs of your, in your seed catalogs. For tomatoes, some growers prefer indeterminate or vining types, citing that when they're pruned, that this can give them higher yields. And also, many growers will plant heirloom tomatoes, which can demand a higher price, but they will often yield less or crack under field-grown conditions. Cucumber varieties that work well in hoop houses would include the higher value burpless varieties or Asian varieties. On your screen, you see um, a, an example of some bed systems. When setting up your cropping system, there are several configurations depending on your resources and production system. Here are two examples of a raised bed system, one permanent and the other created annually. If you have specific resources available, such as these cement blocks at Whitstone Farm, you can incorporate them into your hoop house cropping system. On your screen shortly will be an example of utilizing resources available to you. My friends here at Burn and Daylight Farm in Chino Valley, Arizona, had access to a lot of clean barrels that you see here, the blue barrels on the top left, in Chino Valley, Arizona. And they use them to plant crops that have a quick turnaround, such as these beets. These tomatoes here on the right are planted in a bag system. And you also saw a, a bag system using, utilizing lettuce uh, in a previous slide. The advantage of these systems is that they are portable, but the disadvantage to this system would be that, this is, that they require disposal at the end of the season. Plastic can be used for early warm season crops. It's also good for weed management. On your screen is a, an example of a mixed cropping system that demonstrates how plastic can be used to give a soon-to-be-planted, warm-season, warm-loving crop of tomatoes a boost, while the greens and the other cooler season crops continue to be harvested in the spring. One consideration with plastic mulch, as Andy mentioned earlier, is that you, if you are certified organic, the plastic must be removed at the end of the season. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about some irrigation options. Drip irrigation lends well to hoop house to a hoop house system, especially if your crop is typically in for a longer period of time. Some of the advantages of drip are that it, it is an efficient use of water and fertilizer. It can reduce wheat competition in areas outside the beds. And you have the ability to si simultaneously irrigate and work inside the tunnels. Also, there's a reduction in disease potential because water doesn't get on the leaves. However, sprinkler systems work best for establishing a direct seeded crop such as lettuce and greens. This micro-irrigation system that you see here on the right can be attached to your drip system tubing. When using a sprinkler, however, it is important to water in the morning to avoid disease problems and plant scald, which can be very common in a greenhouse system. The protective environment that enables your plants to grow so easily also enables weed growth. Many growers hand weed in their hoop house. Another option is through mulching, which you see here on your screen now. As depicted in this picture, mulches can be an effective weed management tool in the hoop house. Mulch can be a plastic mulch, as you see under these tomatoes, which can also help with soil warmth or something non such as straw, which you see here behind the tomatoes next to the baseboard. When using a natural mulch such as straw, it is important not to use hay. Spent hay is something that farmers seem to be, it seems to be easily accessible 
by farmers, but hay can have weed seeds that can actually make your weed situation much worse in your hoop house. Disease management is similar in hoop houses as in the field. And one of the advantages of growing in a hoop house is there is usually a lower incidence of disease. There are certain diseases that tend to show up in hoop houses, which are listed here on your screen. Prevention and sanitation are especially important in hoop house disease prevention. Air ventilation is very important, especially for organisms such as leaf mold and powdery mildew, which you see here on these tomatoes. Variety selection is also important for some diseases, especially for verticillium wilt in tomatoes. Good sanitation measures are key. It's important to remove residues, especially if you have any sign of disease present in your hoop house. Crop rotation is also important, especially if you notice the disease in your hoop house. Another option if you are not growing in your hoop house, is to open it up in the winter to allow for spores to be killed. This would be more effective in northern climates. Okay. Encouraging beneficials can be difficult in a hoop house with a closed system. Hoop houses with end walls might have more pollinators and natural enemies, but it could also attract pests. Some growers will actually screen up their roll-up sides to prevent pests from entering and introduce pollinators and beneficials into the hoop house, such as Andy mentioned earlier. If you do introduce insects into the hoop house for this, these purposes, it is important to keep your hoop house relatively cool and humid to keep the beneficials from leaving or dying. Some common hoop house insect pests to watch out for in your hoop house are going to be on your screen shortly. Aphids, as shown on the top left here, are common greenhouse pests which can be easily handled through introducing beneficials or using biorational pesticides or horticultural soaps. Mites, which are on the top right, tend to become a problem when the hoop house becomes hot and dry. This is actually a, a very magnified version of mites, and the, and the best way to see if you have mite damage is the sign of webbing on the underside of your leaves. Increasing the humidity can help with mites as well as some beneficial, introducing some beneficials. Whitefly, as seen here on the bottom left, is another common pest in greenhouses. They, there are another, a number of biorational controls for these pests. For all intents and purposes, I'm defining a biorational pesticide as either a microbial pesticide meaning some kind of formulation of viruses, bacteria, or fungi, or nematode that have low non-target impacts, or pesticides derived from plants that have no, low non-target impacts and degrade into non-toxic components in the environment, or various new types of pesticides, such as particle film barriers, or also called surround, pheromones, and compounds such as phenosad that have low non-target impacts. The key here with biorationals is that they have a low non-target impact, meaning they, they have very little impact on beneficials or pollinators or mammalian toxicity, and they degrade quickly in the environment into non-toxic components. ATRA has a biorational database that can pro provide you with pest management options for these pests and many others. Go to www.ncat.org and type in biorationals and a search function, to, and it should pull up. So before deciding to install your hoop house, it is important to determine if this enterprise is actually going to be profitable on your farm and to think through a marketing strategy for your hoop house crops. An enterprise budget is the best way to determine whether a hoop house is a good investment for your farm. On your screen shortly will be a sample enterprise budget from a farm in Vermont growing hoop house tomatoes. An enterprise budget typically outlines the fixed costs and variable costs and then subtracts those from the revenues. What you see here are some typical fixed costs that are associated with, with putting a hoop house on your property. 
Fixed costs include the construction costs of your hoop house, heaters, and costs that will not change throughout the course of the year. Another cost consideration are the variable costs. On your screen are some variable costs to consider. These costs will fluctuate from season to season because of the amount you might need and general pricing changes. This includes stuff like plants, irrigation supplies, bees for pollination, and fertilizers and composts. Variable costs also include labor, and that is something that you need to consider the amount of labor that is going to be um, put into putting up your hoop house and maintaining it. Finally, you can determine what your total combined fixed and variable costs are and subtract these from your projected revenues. The revenues here are based on a yield of about 3,500 pounds coming out of this 14 by 144 foot tunnel. The tomatoes are valued at about $2.50 per pound. So as you can see, these folks are making about $4,300 from a 14 by 144 foot tunnel. Since your production costs will be higher in a hoop house, it is important to be able to get top dollar for your product. This typical, typically will happen from direct marketing, but even at a farmer's market, it is important to differentiate your product from other field-grown stuff. Timing is critical here. For example, you can get a higher price for raspberries and strawberries if they are sold two weeks before and after the field-grown field -grown ones are available. This is similar with tomatoes. Or as I mentioned previously, heirloom tomatoes that are hoop house grown will have fewer, fewer crafts and can command a higher price. I mentioned some strategies for selling at farmer's market. Another strategy is working with other growers at your market to form a winter farmer's market. This would mean encouraging other vendors that grow and make products other than vegetables to keep people coming into the market. Another option is through a community-supported agriculture program um, to, and develop, if you already have a community-supported agriculture farm, uh, market on your farm, you can also extend that into a winter community-supported agriculture program. Another direct or sometimes called direct wholesale option is restaurant sales. Some restaurants are looking for a superior product and your hoop house vegetables will have that advantage. On your screen is an example of a good way to approach a restaurant from my friends here at Mar Cristo Farm. Introduce yourself to the chef and give them a clean, well-packaged sample such as this lettuce here. You should also hand them a price list with, with the sample, which includes your availability and take care not to come during their peak hours of lunch and dinner. It is generally best to avoid the kitchen between 10.30 and 2. Some wholesale accounts can be lucrative as well. Grocery stores are becoming more receptive to local foods, especially hothouse tomatoes. Wholesale accounts will not give you the top dollar price of a direct market, but there are advantages to not having to sit at a farmer's market for a whole day or having to deal with a picky chef. Again, in a wholesale situation, it is important to differentiate your product through off-season and heirloom crops or tasty mild greens from your hoop house. Finally, hoop houses can be a lucrative and relatively easy way to add value to your farm business. It is important to determine your costs, develop a market, and finally determine which type of hoop house and cropping system will fit best into your farmscape. For in for more information and publications on many of the topics we have covered here today, visit our website, www.atra.ncat.org. We thank you for listening in, and with that, we have some time to answer questions. If we are unable to get to your question, however, please feel free to email either myself or Andy at the email addresses listed on your screen. Thanks for attending. Thanks, Tammy, and thanks, uh, Andy. Um, as Tammy mentioned, we've got about 15 minutes here that we're going to be taking some questions that were asked during the webinar um, by you attendees. And I want to start first to thank everyone for their, uh, their um, participating in this. We've had over 600 people online during this webinar, which we think is a wonderful 
example of uh, how to use technology to really spread the word about sustainable agriculture. Um, if you have specific questions about your own hoop house systems that don't get answered during this webinar or during this question and answer period, feel free to visit our ATRA website or phone or email us through our ATRA helpline to discuss your own hoop house issue with one of our agricultural specialists. Um, I do want to also mention that um, the entire webinar you just viewed will be available as an uh, audio video file on our ATRA website in a couple of days. And you'll then be able to view the entire presentation at your leisure, listen to Tammy and Andy's presentation, see all the websites, see all the statistics and, and calculations that you couldn't, couldn't look at very quickly on our slides. So, and I know that some of you um, commented that you had di some trouble with your dial-up seeing the slides come up quickly enough. So know that this will be available for the long term on our ATA website, as will our other webinars during this year. We do have some wonderful questions. We've got probably 20 wonderful questions that I've got um, listed here that Tammy and Andy will, will help answer in the few minutes we have available here. Um, I'll just go through them. I've tried to group them around different issues, and I'll try to throw them out to Andy and, and Tammy and see what they have to say. Um, first question was from a listener in Summit, Colorado, and she says, the elevation here is over 10,000 feet, and the growing season without greenhouses is only about three months. Are high tunnels um, something that I should consider in my own operation here? Tammy, you're a Colorado resident. Maybe you've got some insight on that one. <laughs> yes, um, my, uh, my parents live in Lake George, which is also about 10,000 feet. And um, I've actually encouraged them to put a hoop house in their, on their property because um, the thing about the West is that while you may – you may have inclement weather or it might get cold at night. The sun consistently shines, especially in Colorado. I think there's about 300 days of sunshine a year. So the hoop house growing lends well to those kinds of climates. So, yes, I would encourage you to, um, to put a hoop house in, on your property, it would definitely help with um, increasing the season of some warm, warm loving crops, and um, and also the solar gain in that in that situation it would be very helpful with the the sunny days in Colorado. Thanks, Debbie. Um, we had a listener ask about the. Uh, Talk a bit about Elliot Coleman's quick hoops concept. I know Andy, both you and Tammy have, have, have uh, praised Elliot Coleman's um, approach to that. You might talk a bit about his resources and what your what your opinion is of his uh, approach to hoop houses. Sure, Elliot Coleman is a uh, tremendous, uh, well-known, knowledgeable grower here, and in, in, he's in Maine now, and um, has written numerous books on organic farming, and actually has a new one out on the. The winter harvest, and uh, he has uh, some of the started probably probably the pioneer in this country was starting with uh, with hoop houses, uh, in particular low tunnels. Um, he's also uh, incorporated the low tunnels into his high tunnels, um, which we talked about earlier. Just uh, where, with his location, uh, just gets the most production out of that type of system. Um, just a, a great grower. I, uh, some of his books are uh, the New Organic Grower, the Four Season Harvest. Um, so I would, I, you know, they've, they've helped me along the way. If you're not familiar with them, you know, check out his books. But um, he is, uh, I would say, a leader in using hoop houses. And, Andy, you had mentioned to me previously this week about another hoop house web, so, web resource you thought was a very one that people should know about besides our ATRA sources. You might give that address and comment on that. Yeah, I think there's, there's quite a few out there. Um, in, in, including the suppliers uh, are very knowledgeable and have support lines. But uh, there's a, a website called hightunnels.org, uh, which also has a uh, chat room, and you can you can talk with other folks who have questions and, and answer them. There's also um, hoophouses.com, which also has information and chat rooms. Um, but there's a lot of resources out there. A lot of them are online, uh, including ATRA. And um, also, if you're interested in, like, Haygrove, Haygrove has a great website and support line. Uh, so it just depends on what you're interested in. You can contact that supplier, check out their website. Um, another one that just, just came to me is the American Society for Plastic Culture. Uh, I think their website is plasticculture.org. Um, they have all sorts of great information, including using plastic, uh, plastic mulches and row covers. 
And, and related to that, Andy, we've had several questions about where can I get kits or designs for hoop houses? Is, is there any specific source you would recommend above others for people to look at? Oh, there's all sorts of them throughout the country, and uh, I would urge you in particular look to, to more local ones just so you're not paying the heavy shipping costs. Um, Haygrove is actually out of the U.K., but they have an American uh, warehouse and supplier. Um, some of the photos I showed came from Ledgewood Farms, which is in New Hampshire. Uh, that's a Gothic style. They have the, the nice wood end walls. Uh, Farm Tech is another supplier that's uh, nationally recognized. And they are also uh, now introduced the uh, the roll up sides, so they have the roll up and roll down sides. Um, but they're they're a national company. They have warehouses throughout the country, so shipping is a little cheaper. Um, but also a lot of farmers are suppliers. Um, but if you contact us, we can come up and try and find one more more localized and, and help with those shipping costs. Yeah, that, that's a good point, Andy. That if you didn't catch the information right here in the question answers uh, phase. Two things you can do. One is, again, the entire webinar will be online on our ATRA website at atra.ncap.org within a couple of days, and including this question-answer discussion. So everything we're talking about right now you can listen to and, and write down and repeat till you get it. So we know we're throwing a lot of things out here at their very end. Um, <clears throat> and also you can call our ATRA helpline and on our ATRA website to talk directly to an agriculture specialist if you have specific questions we don't get to here. Um, Andy, also related to, to equipment, we had a question about can gray or black window screen be used to shade cloth in a hoop house? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not familiar with anyone using that. Um, I think it would work. There's, there's different, um, the fabrics of the shade cloth come in different sizes and, and um, weight of material. So I'm not sure the window screen would provide uh, uh, the needed protection or the scale you need, but um, and I'm not I, I'm not aware of anyone doing it. But you know, if you can get the shade to help cool down a little bit some of the during the summer and you know not make sure that the, the uh, plants are so leggy, um, you know, it's worth a shot. Good. How about uh, wind issues? Um, we had a question about dealing with high wind areas and any specific precautions you take to prevent your hoop house from ending up in the next county. I would have to say wind is one of the the most you know one one or two top important issues in regards to setting up your hoop house. Um, numerous people lose their hoop houses uh, due to wind, and, and if you are in a windy location during those the, the heavy winds, if they're a particular month, a lot of farmers are taking down the plastic during those months just to preserve it and make sure the the integrity of their structure stays stays, stays the same. Um, wind is also a big issue when you're putting the plastic on. Uh, if it's windy, you're going to have a lot of problems getting that over your uh, your frame there. And also keep in mind, you're you're uh, with a high tunnel, you're up in the air uh, constructing this. So it, there's also a safety issue, and wind can be a concern. But uh, location, location, location. How about are there specific issues about how to attach the plastic to the high tunnel or low tunnel in a high wind area? I'm thinking of, you know, how you build for hurricane, how we build houses with certain precautions. Are there certain things you do differently for a high wind situation in constructing and attaching the, the plastic to help prevent the wind issue? Yeah, I think that that really depends on uh, your structure. If it's uh, from a manufacturer, you're going to want to go with a stronger structure. Or if you're building your own, uh, you're going to want to use a, a heavier plastic, um, something, you know, four or six mil um, I've seen people who have put grommets in uh, the end and, and you know, use sandbags or something to hold them down if necessary. Uh, but again, you're, you're attaching it to the hip board and the baseboard. So if your structure is secure, hopefully the plastic isn't, uh, you know, you're not flapping too much. But, you know, a wind can come through, especially if you have your, your, wall, your side walls up or your, your gable ends open and, and, you know, really cause a lot of damage in your hoop house. Um, but there's, you know, different methods to, to keep it secure. Um, and, and the roll-up sides and roll-down sides really help with that also. Good. Thanks, Andy. That's certainly we've had several people question that, raise that issue. I think it is a concern in high wind areas of uh, the dealing with that. Um, I'm going to turn to a few production questions about uh, crops and mulches and that too. For hey, perhaps Tammy, you can take some of these. Um, one sure. question we had was one question was has anyone used used carpet mulch in a commercial setting. The listener thought this was the best mulch he'd ever used and was liking 
the fact that it's recycling a material and it's a great weed deterrent in their opinion? Um, I haven't actually heard of that being used in a commercial situation. The one thing that you would need to be um, most concerned about with carpet is there are some glues in a carpet. So as it breaks down, it might cause some toxicity to the plants um, or just general toxicity in the soil. But um, I haven't actually heard of it being used in a commercial situation. But I think, you know, I'm a big fan of utilizing the resources that you have available at your farm or um, our garden or property. And if you have some spent carpet, then um, I have seen that used as mulch in a, um, in a garden setting. Okay. Also had a question about uh, companion planting and what kind of flowers you use in a high tunnel to attract beneficials. Just the overall question about, I guess, companion planting and attracting uh, beneficial insects. Sure. Um, well, first I'm going to make a plug for one of the ATRA publications on, um, on farmscaping for biological controls. Um, that, that publication has a list of a lot of different um, publications are a lot of different plants that you can use for that. But um, typical plants that do attract beneficials are the umbels. So like even a dill, a flowering dill, or fennel, um, or the, um, I'm trying, a, a yarrow is another umbel. They really tend to attract beneficial insects. Um, and the dill and the fennel are more annuals, and a yarrow is more of a perennial. And um, so the umbels really attract a lot, and then um, a lot of nectar type of flowers. Um, and, and most flowers will attract beneficials and, and pollinators. But the key is making sure there's enough. Um, it, it's, as Auntie mentioned in the, um, in the webinar, it, it's just it's a deterrent to try to get into, actually get into the tunnel. So if you're in favor of not screening and such, you know, the roll-up sites will help with that. Good. Um, another question, Tammy, about uh, crop rotation in hoop houses. Are there issues around uh, rotating your crops and seasonal and yearly rotations that you should be aware of? Um, yes, I, I think um, it's, it's often not employed, but I think crop rotation is very important, especially to prevent disease buildup and insect, insect buildup of specific pests that are um, attracted to specific types of crops that you're growing in there. Um, but it, so if you can only put one hoop house on your farm, the movable hoop houses are an option for crop rotation. Because um, you're wanting to grow, if you just have one hoop house, I think most growers are wanting to actually grow the warm season crops in there. So it, do, it, it does provide, that's problematic if you only have one hoop house because you're growing those same crops every year. Um, so a movable hoop house helps with that. Or two hoop houses, um, and then you can rotate between the two, two hoop houses. Um, if you're... Just, you know, if you're a smaller grower, you can actually rotate within the hoop house, but that, um, that may help with disease, but not so much with insects. Okay. Um, also, um, Tammy, do hoop houses um, increase soil temperatures, store temperatures to the extent that they would allow direct seeding of warm soil plants such as peppers earlier? And a similar question, I guess, from a, in a listener in Indiana about... Um, growing tomatoes and the need for shade cloth over tomatoes. So I guess we have a series of questions that are probably site-specific about certain crops, but maybe just address the overall issue of season extension for warm season crops and finding them earlier and dealing with shading issues. Right. Um, and Andy might want to talk about this a little bit too, but I, I, I have not seen um, situations where stuff is direct seeded into um, into a hoop 
house. This may be possible actually, you know, further south, but in the more northern temperate climates, um, oftentimes what I see is the plants are started ahead of time to get them a little bit of boost because while the hoop house um, may increase the um, the temperature and the soil temperature a little bit, it, it's like four, ten, 4 to 10 degrees. So a lot of those warm, loving crops really, um, that really helps. The, of course, the plastic mulch would r definitely help um, if you're really interested and have limited space to start something, a plastic mulch would really help warm the soil to between 60 and 70, which a lot is what most of the um, warm season crops like. Um, and then, yeah, as soon as as the season progresses, the the um, and it starts to become hotter. I think that um, shade cloth can be very helpful, even for the warm loving crops. But I don't know, Andy, if you want to expand on that or add on that. Sure. Um, I have direct seeded in hoop houses uh, in the Northeast, and um, success. Uh, you know, I found was with really spinach, chard, and kale, some of these crops that can take the colder temperatures. And there's even a, a farm in, in New York, Slack Hollow Farm. Uh, one of their hoop houses has a radiant floor heating system. And, uh, you know, this costs quite a bit. But, it, but in another hoop house they have that isn't uh, heated like that, they've determined that uh, it could be negative 20 degrees outside and 15 degrees inside the tunnel. And, and even if these crops do freeze, as I mentioned earlier, um, once they thaw out, they're fine. They're still marketable. There's really no difference in quality or yield. Um, so you just, you know, you can use that interior row cover. Uh, that really helps. But, you know, if it's still going to get that cold, uh, some crops can be grown year-round in the winter with no supplemental heat. Uh, with the shade cloth, uh, this, this can be a, a tremendous benefit to southern growers, uh, particularly with, with tomatoes. Um, again, you know, you can take your plastic off if you're not going to be moving the greenhouse, and, and in that way you can either add the shade cloth or just leave it open. But uh, I think uh, for most folks who do use shade cloth have seen uh, uh, stronger, healthier plants uh, that, that once the shade cloth is incorporated. Thanks, Andy. Um, another question about marketing, Tammy, maybe for you is um, the listener wanted to know, is there a benchmark revenue per square foot that you should shoot for for uh, profitability in a hoop house commercial operation? Um. Well, you know, I really think that depends on the cost of um, the hoop house itself. So the structure, how much time you're putting into it. And so that's where that enterprise budget is really important. Is First you need to determine the um, what the costs are, and then after that, um, figure out what type of revenue you're going to need. And, and you, you might mention that you have some enterprise. Either. I was just going to say we, we do have some after publications on enterprise budgets and calculations that you could refer to, too. Yes, there there are those. Um, and there's actually, um, I referenced it quite a bit in this uh, webinar uh, by uh, Tracy Frisch and Ted Blomgren, uh, bo both great, um, they're very knowledgeable on hoop house and farming in the Northeast. And they, they did a publication on high tunnels, and that has a series of, um, it has a series of enterprise budgets specifically for high tunnels or hoop houses. Good. Uh, thanks, Tammy and Andy. I think we're going to kind of wrap it up with that. We've gone for a full hour here and, and still have over 450 people online, which is great to have that many people still listening to our Q&A. Um, on behalf of ATRA and the National Center for Purple Technology, I want to thank you all for joining our webinar and remind you again that this entire webinar is available online. You can listen to it in its entirety. And if there's anything you missed in terms of a website address or a specific publication, or a Q&A at the end, that's all going to be online where you can go and listen to that at your leisure. Again, our website is, is www.atra.ncat.org. So atra.ncat.org is where the information will be located. 
Thank you all for attending this webinar on extending your growing season with high tunnels. Um, you'll be receiving a notification of our upcoming webinars during the rest of this year. We intend to do uh, two or three more at least this coming year, and we'll keep you informed as of our uh, future topics. Thanks again for attending. On behalf of NCAT and Atra, I wish you a good day and good farming. Bye-bye.